Hey, how's it going, everybody? We're back. It's episode 150 of Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. And if you're used to downloading the show, you're you're probably looking at this and saying, wait, this is a Thursday episode and it's not 10 minutes long or 12 or I think one time we went 15, 18 minutes on a Thursday topic show. No, this is a full length episode, but we're doing something a little bit differently. We've done two of these now. The second one will air next week, episode 150 and 152. We're kind of combining two things that we heard a lot of feedback on people enjoying. The first was the roundtable concept. Back on the episode on McDojo's, we had a couple guests come on and the three of us had a great conversation. And then back on... Oh, what episode was it? One one thirty five. It wasn't that long ago. We did a Thursday show on women in martial arts and really talking about some of those differences. Now, I was fully aware when I recorded that episode that I was not the best person to talk about women in martial arts. But we heard from a lot of listeners that said, hey, we want more of this. And it wasn't just women that wanted more conversation on it. It was men too. So We went back, talked to a few of the women that have appeared on the show and said, here's the concept. Would you like to get involved? And they said, yes. Excuse me. So what we have today, we've got Renshi, Lisa Magira, and we've got Master Amanda Meltzer. And the three of us are going to have a chat. Next week, we have three different folks. Now, this episode is not just for women. And it's not just for men that don't understand the female perspective of martial arts. It's hard to come up with a a title and a concept that that I can really break down into a couple sentences to put out what we're doing. And if you've listened this far, thank you. And I just want you to check it out because it's going to make you think. We get into the nitty gritty, not just about men's perspective and women's perspective and roles, but really some of the, the deep underlying structure that is martial arts and what it's become today. So I really enjoyed it. I came away thinking about a lot of different stuff, stuff that I hadn't even considered to consider. So with that said, I'll turn it over and you can listen to the show. Wrenchy Lisa and Master Meltzer, welcome back to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Hello. Thanks, Jeremy. I'm assuming at this point, because I'm recording this before the intro, that at some point I have primed the listeners for what we're doing here today, but on the off chance that I didn't do that, or if they've forgotten, maybe they have very short attention spans, we're going to talk about some topics today that relate to women's involvement in the martial arts. And I did not pick these questions. These were questions that were selected by the two of you and a few others that were kind of involved in this project. And, And I first appreciate you being here, and thank you for your time, and I'm looking forward to learning and and being part of this conversation and for listeners out there the goal here is that we and i think you put it best wrenchy that we compare and contrast some of the the gender differences um that's kind of redundant isn't it? that we compare and contrast men and women in the martial arts right so absolutely okay so let's jump in you know, let's let's just start with the first question I have here. These are in no particular order. What might cause a woman to stick with martial arts training, and why might she stop training? I think for a woman to stick with it, it's empowering. When other men that have never trained see her doing it, it gives her a sense of power. Elaborate. Well, you know, um, I know like people that I know. They find out what I do, and they they're just in awe of what. I can do what I've been doing and how long I've been training. And then I try to tell people, you can do that too. You know, if you just stick to it and keep your heart in it. Okay. Renchi, I feel like I cut you off. Go ahead. No, no, that's okay. Um, you know, I feel like in, in, when it comes to staying in karate, I don't think that's, I, I don't feel like that's a gender uh, question or at least in the first phases of, of, of a martial arts career, you know, people, they stay or they go because they love it or they don't, or in the case of a child, because their parents saying you're going or you're not, <laughs> you know? Um, but from, in my experience, people who stay 
it's more about that they can't do without it versus that they want to come, you know, they just can't see themselves without it in their life. And I guess that was my own experience. It never occurred to me things that would be challenges for other people, whether it was the time of a class or the distance to a class or, you know, we, we talked about the color of a uniform. Like It didn't even occur to me that that was a problem. It was just how do you get to the next step? I would agree with all of that also because I you know, was pregnant with both of my children through all of my training and I never stopped going. <laughs> I continued. Me too. <laughs> yeah, I couldn't yeah. imagine ever going. So. Was I was glad when they when they said, you know, when because you, when you're pregnant and, you know, they say you can do a physical activity if you've been doing it before. So I said, OK. And I was like, that's good because I've been doing karate for a whole bunch of years. I'm going to keep doing it. I just didn't do bag work. And the only person I sparred with was Sensei John Trader because I trusted him. Exactly. There was very few people I worked with. And, you know, I worked on other things that didn't involve a lot of contact, but you could still keep doing it. I did a lot of research. There wasn't a lot out there, but there were some things. Are there any... Reggie, you, you mentioned kind of that first phase of training, and, and I think anybody that's been training for a while, whether they've owned a school or not, knows that, that you know those first few weeks, first three months are really kind of, I don't want to say make or break, because certainly people drop out after that, but that's really where the highest rate of attrition is. People come in, they give it a shot, and realize it's not for them. Are there any things that might be specific to being a woman that might bump up that really kind of increase that attrition rate, something that maybe a school owner could consider uh, accommodating? Well, I mean, I, I have, I guess I have two answers for that. I think that for, you know, when it comes down to, you know, something as maybe highbrow as brain theory, people make decisions based on emotions, not based on logic. So how a person feels about their training, whether it's, you know, maybe they don't like being barefoot or they do like being barefoot or they don't like the uniform or they, I had a woman tell me, she said, well, I didn't come back because you had the elastic waistband uh, pants and it made my muffin top like stick out over it. And I was like, and so this was years later. I was like, well, we have other pants. You didn't say anything. So, you know, and again, but she was somebody who something was going to knock her out anyway. Um, but when it comes to that emotion and making those decisions, I think you're right. Yes, there's that first day. How's What's the emotion of the first day and how does it feel? Um, and then the first week and the first month and how do you get your stripes and your rewards and your you, how do you take critiquing? There's so much that goes into that on, you know, their perception and our and, and the way that we approach our students. Um, however, there was there was a time. A couple of years ago, um, actually it was more than that, it was four years ago, um, we had a women's night uh, in the dojo and I had a conversation in mind and the conversation was based on um, how, do I, how do I get people to see uh, how they can bring the dojo outside into the world. And so to make a very long story short, we decided that the biggest difference between men and women was that women are emotional and men... Are, don't wear it on their sleeve quite so much. And so that because we're emotional, you know, what does that mean for us just as people? And then what does that mean in the dojo? Well, it means that if you cry, there ends up being a certain amount of shame um, to the tears, whether they're valid or not. And that's a whole other conversation. But but being emotional um, can be a problem when you're in a very male dominated kind of environment. I know. Amanda, what would you say? You know, what, how do you feel about that? Um, I think that's true, and especially in competition. You know, if you get hit and you just lose your composure, it could be embarrassing in front of, you know, all the other male competitors that are there watching or judging, and it can be hard to deal with. Now, is that is is that potential embarrassment? Is that... I don't... I'm putting myself in that position, you know, and, and certainly, you know, 
we've all taken our shots and I've, I've taken enough shots in, in front of people, be it in competition or in training and, you know, lost a bit of composure. And, and it's embarrassing to me as a man. So I, I know that that's not something that's exclusively the territory of women, but is there a different quality to it in, because it's, it's culturally, if not just in terms of raw numbers, a male dominated realm. Is there something about having to represent women strongly? I mean, is, is, is that there? I'm kind of grasping here. I, I hopefully you, you get what I'm asking. I think some of it comes down to processing. You know, how do how do men process things? How do women process things? How do boys? How do girls? How do kids? You know, and I think women tend to think a lot more about something. What did that mean? How did that feel? Did they think badly of me? Who did they do it because they don't like me? You know, women can be in that place. It's not necessarily the case. I mean, um, but they can. You know, they can be. And so, I imagine so can men. But I do think that we process things very differently. Um, I don't know. I don't know. That's a hard. It's a hard one to 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 say. Is there a gender difference when it comes to being hit? You know, being hit hurts. Uh, but the, how does that affect how you feel? Well, hurts hurts. And if do I want to go somewhere where I um, I'm getting hit? And is that abuse? Is it not abuse? You know, there's a lot of kind of questions that go into that. Um, maybe I'm raising more questions than answering. I think people deal with that differently. Like for me, I, I like that physical contact and other women can't handle that or don't feel the need to engage in that. Why do you like it? I, I don't know. (laughs) I just need that, whether it's punching the bag or kicking the paddle or sparring someone, just that feeling of getting that power out of your system somehow. It feels so real. It's such a real, tangible thing. Mm. It's not pretend. Right. Right. I think maybe women that stick with martial arts feel the way men feel about it more. And that women that don't stick with it, they just can't handle that emotion or feeling the way that that feels and they don't like it, so they shy away from it. Mm. I think people bring different expectations, too. You know, some people, just like if you're if you're dealing with kids, there are kids who come to karate because they want to be a power ranger, and then they get there and they realize that it's work, you know. And, uh, you know, a lot of women, at one point in our dojo, there were probably, and at most times, there's probably at least 80% of the people, male and female, have either been directly or one degree separation from some type of abuse. Um, And so when you come to the dojo and all of a sudden you leave because you're doing grappling and you have handprints on your wrist or, you know, you've gotten punched or kicked, you know, what do you relate that to? Do you relate it to violence and how is it presented to you within the dojo? Is it a training exercise or is there like a kind of meanness behind the activity. And, you know, we all have to make that judgment for ourselves. And certainly if you ask any of my male or female students at different times, they'll say that I'm scared of you. And I'm like, well, I'm just over here having fun. I don't know why you're scared of me, but I know that within the dojo, we all have a persona that comes across with a seriousness and a focus and a you better not screw with me kind of attitude. And, you know, you never know who's on the other side of that, that receiving, the receiving end of that, um, that focused look we might have. Sure. So if, if it's a question of expectations, and I think that that makes a lot of sense, you know, people come in and regardless of what it is, whether it's martial arts or, you know, another sport or a job or uh, a romantic relationship, whatever it is, we, we bring our own experiences and those congeal to form our expectations of whatever is going to go on. Would there be benefit for men and women for more tempering of expectations into reality before they even set foot on the training floor? Like what they would expect from a class? Not just from a class, but from from training overall. I mean, we've talked about an emotional component 
Um, we, we've talked about the fact that a lot of people, not just in martial arts, but in the world are fairly closely connected to some, some unpleasant aspects of humanity through, through sexual abuse and, and assault and, and, and so on. And for a lot of people, those can bring up either emotional components from past experiences or it can make people feel uncomfortable because it reminds them of what maybe those things could be. Well, I think going into a studio, um, you should know that it's a safe place and that you should be able to trust the people that are there and that it's, you know, it's an exercise and it's a workout, but it's also real world world training. But if you don't feel safe there, you should be able to talk to someone about why you don't feel safe there. You know, and I don't think every dojo is safe. I think that I, you know, I recommend to people at, you know, if, if they're going to look at a karate school, if I had a student leaving this area and they said, well, I'm going to go, you know, to such and such location, I say, well, you know, why don't you go to a couple of different schools and sit and invest the time in watching a full class to see what they're like? You know, to me, a karate, karate is a family. And if you're going to enter into this long-term relationship with a family, you want to know you fit in and that you feel welcome and that it feels safe. And what better way than to go sit on the sidelines for an hour and just check it out? Sure. I agree. It depends on the studio. Our studio is very family-oriented. We have, you know, parents and their children coming together, brothers and sisters coming together. And it really depends on what you're looking for in a studio. No. Absolutely. Whether it's for yourself or for your kids. But I do think, you know, it's just an, an, it's, a martial arts career is an investment in time. And why not take that one hour? You would go interview for a job. You know, right. you would go look at a house if you were going to buy it. You would go check it. You could check out colleges and schools. Why wouldn't you check out, you know, a martial arts school if you're in the process of choosing? Sure. And I, I know we could go down that road for quite a while. And we've talked about this, this subject on the, on the show before we've done an entire episode on how to recommend that someone may go about choosing a martial arts school. So I don't, I don't want to dig too deep into that, but it sounds like there may be some benefit around setting expectations, especially for anybody out there that is a school owner, you know, to do a little bit more than, than give a, you know, 15 seconds of here's what you can expect. Jump in on the floor, you know, wear, wear some sweatpants. Um, you know, and, and that could be a, a frequently asked questions or something, or something that you could hand over to people as they're considering the school. Something that says, you know what, if you're uncomfortable with your uniform, let us know because maybe you're wearing it wrong. You know, maybe we got you the wrong size. You know, it, it, it could be things like that. But I want to move on to the next question. And that's around gender specific classes. Now, I've, I've heard that some schools do conduct women's only classes, and I've heard of, granted, a smaller percentage, but I have heard of some schools that run male only classes. Of course, the majority of schools run everybody together. If they make a differentiation, it's around age or what material is being covered in that class. Do you two feel there would be some benefit in, and what drawbacks, if any, might there be? to classes that are just women or, or just men? I'm not a fan, really, of the all-female class because, man, there's just nothing better than going up against a big guy and being successful. If you want to be empowered, man, go for that. <laughs> That's my feeling. So I, I don't really have time in my schedule, and when I've done female, you know, like a women's self-defense class, I don't, I'm in a small town. I don't get enough draw and enough people to fill the class for me to warrant it on a regular basis. But I have had all female, let's say I have a, you know, one night, all the women show up. Well, then we'll, we'll have a different conversation if it's just a women's class, but I don't tend to run to all female classes. Yeah, I agree. I mean, there's something to working with men that you just learn a lot more and you find out more about yourself but I can see how it would be a benefit to have a couple of women's only classes here and there if you had the population to do that. Okay. So I'm sure there, well, I shouldn't say I'm sure. Are there women that are going to disagree with that? Probably. Probably. 
<laughs> I imagine for, so. For what, for what reason might some schools and, and some women prefer an option, at least, to train side by side with just women? I don't know, you know, about, I don't know, maybe six months ago, I had this kind of revelation about the fact that when you look at personality types, uh, even if it's a female running a school, although I had a, you and I know, uh, Jerry, Jeremy and I both had a female instructor coming up. So I already had that as a role model. Um, but when it comes to, um, and I, you can mark down this time, Jeremy, because I completely forgot what I was going to say. <laughs> uh, um, but, oh, I, it's gone. It's gone. <laughs> I don't know what I was going to say. Both of us came up with a strong female role model. No, it was before that. I was just kind of uh, winging it, trying oh, to get okay. by myself a minute. <laughs> what was the question? <laughs> we were talking about women's only classes. And, and I was asking uh, you both to speculate around oh if somebody else would, would yeah disagree. you know why yeah. why someone might disagree oh yeah well okay so here's my answer as to why i think somebody might disagree is because i think a lot of the personalities that are the you know either the instructors in the school or whatnot are very kind of a type scary personalities a lot of times and you know like i don't know a lot of people who do yoga that like also do martial arts and i'm t- part probably wrong um there's i'm sure there's people out there that do it and they're a particular type of culture but i know whenever i come in contact with like yoga people we have conflict and so there are, is probably a whole group of people out there that would really like a female only class but they're not going to come to me for that because i don't generate um you know a personality that attracts that if that makes sense it does it does. Master Meltzer, do you have any experience, you know, even if it was just impromptu with a class that ended up being only women? I, I know you have, you know, a, a married couple as instructors. You know, you ever show up and it's you and Mrs. Master Lammy and, you know, a couple other women or something? Yeah, I mean, we have a lot of classes that end up being only women's classes because our, our population right now is mostly women and mostly younger women, like teenagers. Um, most of our male students have gone off to college or something like that. Um, and they, we still have a good classes. Um, but it, it definitely changes the aspect when those guys come back from school and it just kicks it up a notch and it makes, I feel like it makes everyone look, work harder. Is that just because there are more people in the room or are the men contributing a different energy to the class? I think both. I mean, they're just more enthusiastic most of the time. And, you know, we see them doing certain things and it just makes us work harder. Not me necessarily, but some of the younger girls in the class. And like, whoa, did you just see that? Like, you can do that too. It's not just because he's a guy. You can throw your energy into that and you can push harder and you can do what he's doing. Is there anything that you notice being lost? Anything that you say, oh, you know, I liked the fact that when it was just the women in the class, you know, this happened. I mean, did, have you noticed anything like that? No, I don't think I have. But again, I'm more, it's for younger women, so it's not a lot of women my age. I don't know if that makes it a difference. Or... If it's just women in the class, I'm more likely to pull, pull everybody aside and say, okay, this is how we fight the men. <laughs> you know, because I think if you whether you're somebody little, uh, just in general, you can be a little male person or, you know, being female. There's different strategy that you have when you are fighting um, a, a bunch of men, you know, as the instructor of the class. I will never, ever, ever spar with a man first before I've seen him a new student for example, I'll never spar with somebody first before I've seen them spar with some of the men in my class because, A, I want to know what's dangerous about them. You know, do they always throw a right roundhouse kick? What do I have to watch out for? And I want to see the attitude behind what they're doing before I spar with them. So I'll, I'll never put myself in that position. But also when I'm, when I'm sparring with somebody bigger than me, my first strategy is don't get hit. You, you know, so I need to be I'm, I'm defensive first. Uh, and 
if I watch them, I can figure out how I can not get hit. Uh, but then I also, the, then the third thing I do is I maintain an attitude of I can kick your butt. And <laughs> so that they, that attitude overrides anything that they think they can do physically. But that's how I approach it. No, is I that, oh, sorry, go ahead. I would just agree with what she's saying. Is that strategy something that you have always had? Is that something that you learned from your instructor? Or is that something you kind of found out the hard way? Um, I don't think I emulated it from Sensei Beth, but she sure had it. You know, I mean, no matter who you were when you walked in the room, you should have been wary about that wary wary of that woman because yes. she's an incredible fighter. <laughs> um, you'd be stupid not to. Um, but I don't think in, in the time frame of me learning it, it was more like remembering it, you know what I mean? Because I didn't have the skill set. I had to earn and learn the skill set to, to get onto that side of things. Um, I had a lot of fear, I think when I was first teaching and didn't think I deserved the rank and how was I going to do this? And a lot of struggle with this kind of male female concept because we had a male female instructing team before my husband and I bought um, the dojo. But he, my husband wasn't of rank when we bought the dojo. He was a yellow belt the day we bought the dojo. Um, so I felt like I had to carry both the male and the female. You know, I had to like nurture and be kick ass. <laughs> you know, and, and it took me a long time to, to figure out what kind of balance there was going to be to just being me in front of the dojo. Now, obviously, everybody's different. Everybody brings a different set of experiences, expectations. We've talked about that to their martial arts training. But how have you found that instructors, especially male martial arts instructors, might do a better job teaching women? I feel our instructor, Master Lamy Sir, expects us all to be equal. He wants us all to be able to do the same things. He doesn't treat us differently because we're girls or treat the guys differently because they're guys. You know, we do what we do and we fight and we spar and we're expected to pay attention and do the best that we can. My, you know, my, my pet peeve when it comes to, um, watching people teach, uh, watching people call things self-defense or hearing somebody call, you know, uh, you know, a joint manipulation technique self-defense makes me completely nuts because especially if it's being demonstrated by somebody who's like six foot two, 240 pounds, and they can flop you on, flop whoever on the floor. Um, you know, if that person grabs my hand, well, I'm not doing a joint lock nonsense. I'm certainly not going to call it self-defense and it's not going to work for me because I'm too small against that particular person. So that's, if I had one big pet peeve, that would be it. Um, so if people could stop calling things that don't work for little people, self-defense, that would be fantastic. Um, and yet on the other side of that, when it comes to just like, um, you know, what Amanda said, she said, you know, expect the same things just because, you know, we talked about being emotional. If you're sparring with somebody, it's very common for, um, more common, I think, for females to use tears or giggling as a way to shut the situation down, you know? Um, and I think we as instructors need to, to know when to stop, but then also when to push through those tears or push through the giggling to get somebody to work harder, to be stronger, to be better. So just to kind of recap as a as a guy who who doesn't do this i guess so if i'm conducting a class and and i hear a woman to use your word giggling that may not be her not paying attention it may be a, a response to something that's come up emotionally for her or or some other challenge that she's addressing or even like a defense mechanism to is, cover is that up. is that what you're saying Grinchy? yeah okay yeah absolutely so how giggling giggling and tears work the same way Okay. So how do we, how do we know the difference? How do you know where that line is? Yeah, I don't know. It's like, it's like a parent, you know, knowing when their kid is messing with you, 
you know, the kid who falls and goes, I'm okay. <laughs> you know, like there was this big commotion, but it wasn't really, you know, you watch, you, you have to watch carefully, you know, did the impact really cause that result? Is it, is I always wait. I kind of, I watch and I wait and I step back and I look and I look for patterns and, um, and you have to know your students, you know, mm. you have to know your students to know what's real, what's not. If they can, if there's just tears coming down their face, you can still keep going. That's not a reason to stop necessarily, you know, but if it's tears and gasping, like you should probably stop. <laughs> you know, it's, it's all about level. Okay. I'm, I'm, I'm putting you know, because... myself in that situation. You know, I'm, I'm trying to, to envision, um, you know, conducting a class or, or being a senior rank in a class working with someone and, and you know regardless of gender i guess and and they start crying you know if i've if i messed up and i kicked them in the face you know i understand why they're crying i know how to handle that situation but if that if that emotional response is coming from something that i can't connect dots on i'm probably going to freeze up i'm not going to know how to how to all right operate. well okay let's let's be real so so female comes to your school. Female has history uh, of abuse. Abuse happens in close. Let's, you know, let's just say in close, in close fighting is an issue for people who've been abused. It's an issue. As soon as you get up in somebody's face, they shut down. They back away. They get confused. They shut down. They cry. They do whatever. Right. So you're there in a post-traumatic stress kind of response. Right. And you're in their space. But you know you're a safe person, but they're experiencing something different. Maybe they're having a flashback. Maybe they're not in that moment, or maybe they're perceiving you as a threat that that you're not intending, right? So so now you're in this safe space. You're I mean you're in this close space. You have to make it space. You have to make it safe. Come on, I know you can do this. You know I know I'm I know I'm up in your face. I'm up in your face for a reason. Come on, you fight through this. You got this. Right. So so you take the physical action that's created, that's obviously creating a problem. And you take your your instructor sense and you bring, you know, we bring the thought process for them until they can do it for themselves. We substitute either the action of what they're supposed to do or even the emotion. Come on, you're stronger than this. Punch me. Hit me. Fight back. You don't need to be afraid of me. You're stronger than that. You know, so you just use positive reinforcing language in the moment that they're having that breakdown and you help them get past it because otherwise it's just going to continue to be a wall. And then, you know, my students, if they don't like people being in close, that's the first place I'm going to go. And I'm going to keep going there and keep going there and keep going there till it's not a problem for them. That's what's so great about martial arts is it can be in, you know, talk therapy. Talk therapy is never going to work for me. I like to talk, but it's not going to solve my problems. Not nearly as fast as being in the dojo, hitting something, hitting a bag and getting that emotion out or being in front of somebody, reliving it, surviving it and knowing I could conquer it the next time. That's how I feel about that. Mm. Have you experienced anything like that, Master Meltzer, either yourself or, or working with another woman? Um, no, I've never experienced that. So I, I guess my question to, to both of you then, um, is around that gaining that knowledge, you know, you, you mentioned Renchi, the, the idea that, you know, you know, this woman has a history of, of being abused. I'm going to guess that a woman that has been abused is going to be more comfortable telling another woman that she has been abused. I mean, does that add up? Um, I don't know. You know, so I, I, my my question is around, you know, if if I'm operating a martial arts school, I'm not sure what percentage of women that come in with a history of abuse are going to let me know. It doesn't seem like it's an appropriate question for me to ask. I mean, maybe there should be some kind of intake form, you know, the, you know, the, the other side of the frequently asked questions that I speculated I on it, earlier. I mean, 25% of your population, one in four, one in four women, one in seven men in the, you know, one in four women in the United States will be sexually assaulted sometime in her lifetime. One in seven men, those numbers are severely underreported. So 
you know, look around any room, room of 100 people, at least 25 have been abused in some way, assaulted in some way at some point in time. It's a big number. So I don't think you have to look far in a dojo to find somebody who has had an experience. And, and they will react. They'll react differently. You know, if, you, if you're perceptive, they will react just a little bit faster or they'll break down a little bit faster. I don't think you have to, you just need to be trusted. You don't need to be male or female, you know, and if they break down and you pull them aside, hey, is there something I need to know here? Hmm. Did I do something wrong? The, the difference is you're in an environment that is the same physical, you're in the same physical space as an abusive or violent situation and yet you're not bringing that emotion to it. You're not bringing that attitude to it. So you have a real opportunity to help somebody get to the other side and change their paradigm around how they feel about it. Okay. And every, indivi every individual, every situation is totally different. But I can tell you I've had numerous, numerous women through my doors that have, you know, we've, we've walked this process. So really, it's just a question of, of watching for it, you know, keeping your eyes open and and trying to detect, you know, using using your skills as a martial artist to observe. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. That makes sense. Would you agree, Master Meltzer? Yes, I would agree with that. Okay. All right. Would you, would you say there's a, a despair? Oh, oh. Somebody's rubbing their face on the microphone. Uh, does there seem to be a disparity between the male and female martial artists at higher ranks uh, in terms of, of numbers, um, skill, um, desire to compete, you know, a anything along those lines? Definitely. I mean, at my age and rank, there are very few women that compete. Yep, I agree. Now, is that because there are fewer women your age and rank overall, or are they not interested in competing? I think it's more of a lack of interest in competing. Why do you think that exists? I'm not really sure, because I just, I have this drive to compete and I enjoy it so much that I don't really understand why people give it up. I mean, I can kind of see giving up the sparring aspect, you know, as you get older, my body isn't as cooperative as I would like it to be a lot of times, but it's still for the, for the fun of it. So I just have to keep trying. Okay. Renchi? I'm not sure, you know, I'm not sure why there are less in my school. The numbers are, are relatively even for, for men and women at all ages, at all ranks, you know, um, but when we, when I go somewhere like a karate camp or an event where there's, uh, you know, where you're looking at people who are third, fourth, fifth, you know, sixth, you know, high, high ranks, uh, it's been my experience that only one in 10, and we talked about this when we did the, you know, when we spoke before that, you know, maybe one in 10 is a school owner, uh, female to male ratio. And I don't know. I'm not quite sure what that's from, but you know, when it's time to, when I thank God I had such a supportive and amazing husband when I was coming up through martial arts, because, you know, leaving the baby at home to go train two nights a week was something that I did on a regular basis because I couldn't live without it. I had to do it. Um, when we bought the dojo, we had a big, we had babysitters come in two nights a week so that the two of us could be in the dojo. You know, it, takes effort to stay in martial arts and raise a family. Um, and thank God we've um, not only done that, but brought our kids up in the dojo. And I know that there are a lot of, um, I'm so thankful to have a spouse who does martial arts and a whole family that does martial arts, because I think it's very difficult, whether you're male or female, to be in the martial arts um, and and not have your spouse in the martial arts. I think, I think that um, uh, couples struggle, you know, because but because, you know, having martial arts is like having, you know, it's like cheating on your spouse. If you're going to go out a couple nights a week and go do that for a few hours <laughs> with all these people. So it's sure helpful to have the whole family involved. Yeah. 
and I wouldn't, and I wouldn't change. Oh my gosh, I wouldn't change raising a fam- my family in the dojo. I wouldn't trade it for anything in the world. Are there any legitimate differences between men and women that we we should, I guess, recognize uh, in the context of martial arts? I mean, overall, men are stronger than women, generally, and that needs to be taken into consideration. But it's not always about overpowering. So as far as sparring, I think that sometimes men and women can spar together, even in competition, as long as there's that level of control. I think men have strength, women have grace. You know... Men ha- are very straight form forward. Oh, they can be analytical, but you know we have. There's analytical people. There's straightforward people. There's people who are very tangential within within the the martial arts. The whole kind of right brain, left brain aspect. Um, are there are there differences? Absolutely, there are differences between us. But I will tell you that um, guys who aren't good guys don't stay in my dojo very long, because there's just I don't have any. Pl- we don't have any place for that. We don't have place for people who are unkind or you know think themselves better than the rest of the people in the room male or female um is that self-selecting or are you encouraging them to go elsewhere it is my house (laughs) (laughs) it's my house and nobody's going to come into my house and you know and be abusive they're not going to at the end of the day i'm going to be there the longest and if they're gonna if they're good people they'll make it alongside me um but <laughs> at the end of the day, it's our house, you know? Yeah, for sure. Talk, I, I want to talk we, a little, go, no, go ahead. Well, you know what? And you, and you really struggle when there's somebody, when there's somebody ruffling the feathers of people in the dojo, you do struggle, you do struggle, but, uh, you know, time, I think time is always on, it's always on our side, always on my side, you, you know? I don't know if that makes sense to you or not, but it does. I I want to talk about that, that idea of strength versus grace, because it's a subject that's come up a few times, you know, when, when we talk about forms and, and the best example of a, of a beautiful kata, pumse, toll pattern, whatever you want to call it, uh, probably a few names I'm leaving out there. The name that inevitably comes up that most people have known from having her Facebook videos shared is Riku Usami. I mean, just an absolutely fantastic practitioner. But when people talk about, you know, great examples of martial arts fighters, in the at at least in unless we open it up to mixed martial arts, the examples people generally give are male. So what, what is it? Is that a cultural thing, or is that something that's inherent to our genders? I think part of it's cultural because people are looking for the grace, look to the woman for that. Not that a man can't do a graceful pattern or a, you know, a nice looking pattern, but when they're looking for someone strong and powerful, they're looking for that man. Okay. Well, I think, you know, the phenomenon of, of like Ronda Rousey, you know, is, or people's kind of, you know, their, I don't know, their awe, their, their want to, to see that kind of raw violence and aggression from the female side within the fighting. I think that, you know, we as a culture, we're seeking it right now. Um, reasons why people stay in martial arts you're probably going to have a different set of reasons from female and male um i'm not sure what those would be necessarily but you know for me i stay because i love to teach um i stay because the training the teaching the practice of the teaching has become the practice for me more so than the competitive side of it and you know just like you know what my partner here said she said you know your body changes over time and you know at 46 years old i don't repair as fast as i used to um, so 
it's a reason that I might not be on the fighting side of things as much as on the teaching side or on the cut the side or on the, you know, different end of things that way. Mm. So I just want to pose one last question before we wind up here. And it's one that, that hadn't come up, but, um, you know, both of you have mentioned this through the conversation a couple times, and that is that you both were raised, so to speak, by a male-female team. And that's something that I don't think very many martial artists get the opportunity to do. And in both of your cases, it's, it was a married couple. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What benefits do you think you gained? You know, what perspective, what bonuses do you think you have from being raised with that multi-instructor, you know, dual gender dynamic that somebody that's being raised by just a man or just a woman might not have? I think with, you know, with Beth and John, it was this raw, incredible power, you know, on Shihan John's side. And then technical, accurate, incredible power and strength on Shihan Beth's side. So you got to see that real balance of the best of both of Beth, uh, Beth and John. And uh, I think that was a real benefit. It's a real benefit to everybody in the dojo to have that, to see that balance. Yeah, with Amy and Paul, it's a similar thing because with Amy being in the wheelchair, her mind works incredibly. She remembers patterns and movements and she can express them verbally. And that helps a lot of people. It doesn't work for some people, but for some people it does. Just being able to talk you through something that she can't show you physically. And then with Paul, you have him right there if you need to watch someone and to learn how to do it physically. So we have both sides of that, the mental and the physical working together. Mm. That's cool. Yeah. And, and, and in both cases, you know, I've been fortunate enough to work with, you know, both teams uh, it, at various times. And of course, you know, one set much more than the other, but you know, there, there's certainly something there with, with their ability to play off of each other, you know, and leverage each other's strengths and recognize the strengths that they have. So I think that's, that's pretty great. All right. So that, that's it for the questions that I have. Do you, either of you want to, you know, kind of leave anything for the listeners to think about? I mean, we've, we've posed a lot of questions and and I don't know about anybody out there listening, but I think I'm going away with more questions than answers. (laughs) And I'm okay with that because it's got me thinking and I like that. But is there anything else that you want to, point out for people to consider just that i think you know i think we do a disservice if we separate ourselves too much i think we're better when we're all in the dojo together uh you know in our school we say that uh if someone tells you you hit like girl you say thank you (laughs) You (laughs) because because it's a compliment and uh and i think that you know, I don't know. I try to I try to break down the the kind of nonsensical political correctness kind of crap that we have going on in in our language and in the way we treat each other now. A little competition, nothing wrong with that. And being a girl, nothing wrong with that. And you know, being strong and being a girl, go for it. Yeah, I would agree with all of that. I'd much prefer to be put in with the men and made to work harder and be expected to do the same things that they do. Agreed. Cool. Well, I want to thank you both for being here, for for being so open and, and, you know, really just kind of having this discussion. Like I said, I learned some stuff. I've got a lot that I've got to consider, and hopefully the people out there are thinking as well, because that was kind of the hope, right? So um, thank you both. Thank you. While I certainly enjoy the Thursday episodes that we normally do, and just the fact that it gives me a wonderful excuse to research a ton of stuff and really just kind of nerd out about martial arts. And while I love our typical Monday shows where I get to talk to somebody and hear their story and, you know, get to hear the the before and after that you all don't get to hear, um, you know, just from, from talking to them before we get into the nitty gritty of the show, there was something about recording this that I really enjoyed. And I felt like 
the three of us were able to kind of move the conversation forward. Instead of it being like a tennis match, it was something a little bit different. It was it was more like uh, soccer, you know, where you're moving down the field. And hopefully sports analogies don't ruin the beauty of what this episode was. But I really enjoyed it. I hope you enjoy it. Next week is a little bit different because there are four of us. And with four, I don't talk as much. I let the three guests carry the conversation and I kind of pop in from time to time, but it had a different flavor than this did. So hopefully you enjoyed it. I would love to hear what you think. You can email info at whistlekick.com. You can leave us information on the show notes at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. You can find the episode up on YouTube, or you can hit us up on social media, Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, and Instagram. Until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day.